Our next topic of presentation is the Latin, the Latin Cross, a brief historical and theological investigation of its symbol and meaning. Well, the, presenta uh, the presenter for this session will be Francis Doroy, who just graduated from IAS, uh, from the Department of uh, Master of Religion in the seminary. At present, he's working as an instructor in School of Theology, Central Philippine Adventist College. So I'd like to welcome uh, Francis Doroy to present his paper. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and happy Sabbath. I'd like to praise God for this opportunity to stand before the saints of God, before scholars, and before smart people. My topic actually is changed a bit. I publish it uh, in my sense that it's more simple and better. Instead of the Latin cross, it's, uh, as mentioned, the theological, etc. I just uh, recast the title into the symbol of the cross, pagan or Christian. And of course, we have here the picture of our logo, and we know that this was uh, adopted way back in 1997. And it's beautiful, right? Uh, what do you think? But some other people, when they look at it, there's a problem with it. Anyway, this afternoon, I'm thinking just to show the presentation. This is my, uh, my uh, I have the paper. I think you just saw it uh, um, a while ago. But I prefer the slides at least to save time. So this is the title. And then the statement of the problem, the cross in the New Adventist logo caused a reaction on some church members. Their belief is a two-pronged speculation. Maybe I can say it, their belief is a twofold speculation. And that is the cross is a symbol of Catholicism and a vestige of paganism. The scripture preclude the use of symbols, in, part, in particular the cross. So ultimately, we ask the question, is the cross pagan or Christian? In fact, I was thinking of the title, is the cross, symbol of the cross, pagan, Catholic, or Christian? But then my dean said, please don't use that title. So, okay, so I followed the dean. Anyway, so the methodology. The study examines this issue, the anti-cross belief, as we, we call it, in its biblical, theological, historical, and archaeological dimensions to ascertain its validity and on the truth. Uh, this is very important to start with. Before we get uh, uh, having this definition, I'd like to tell you an experience that I have had just a few days ago. One student told me, you know, sir, uh, I know of a family in our place. His family is well known in our place. In fact, there are family pastors, and then uh, one of, uh, of the pastors of the family is in the union in the union, as a union officer. But somehow this uh, the one family is no longer a bona fide or an active member of the church. Because when they saw the logo, and there's you know, the problem, the cross, they thought somehow that it's already A sign that uh, you know Catholic belief paganism had in, uh, crept in into the church. Oh, by the way, uh, Brother Marek, is that my time? Yes. Is that all 20 minutes? Ah, oh, okay, it's from, uh, okay. It's undescending. Okay, 
Thank you. So let's go quickly. What is a symbol? It's something that stands for or suggests something else by reason of relationship, association, convention, or accidental resemblance, especially a visible sign of something invisible. Like we are giving here an example, a lion is a symbol of courage. So please keep that in mind. A visible a symbol is a visible sign of something invisible. For our purposes this afternoon, we can say that a symbol, a, vis a symbol is a visible sign of something invisible, in particular, a religious meaning. So in that case, the, re the symbol now is becoming a religious symbol. By the way, this problem is not only uh, uh, acute or, or, or current in the Philippine setting, like in the south of this country, not just uh, the one I've cited to you, but in, in some places, in fact, there are members who went out of the church because of the cross. And also from the outside, the, the offshoots are, are condemning us as you know, catering to, to influences, Catholic and pagan. And then, of course, they went out of the church. And sometimes whole churches are disfellowshipped, went out from, the, from Adventist church because of this issue. So we have here the cross in scripture. What the allusions of the Messiah's death and crucifixion are found in Messianic prophecies. So, uh, in a nutshell, the Messianic prophecies are, are passages in Scripture that foretell the, the death of the Messiah and the manner of death that he would die. So we have here Numbers 21, verse 9. So Moses made a bronze serpent, we're familiar with this, and put it on a pool. And so it was, if a serpent had beaten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So God commanded Moses to make this symbol. And then the closest inference to Christ's incarnation as well as crucifixion, as we will find out later. We have also Isaiah 53, the suffering servant chapter. And then he was accused as an imposter, if we just summarize it in a few words, a false messiah, and crucified between two male factors. Prophecy indicated that he would die with transgressors. And then we have also here Psalm 69, 21. They also give me gall for my food, and when I thirst, they give me vinegar to drink. This applies to David and his enemies, and ultimately to Jesus on, on the cross when he was given gold to drink. And we have the, 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 the source there. Now, it's interesting that the prescribed death penalty in the Torah is stoning, that is primarily prescribed. Others hanging and then decapitating, uh, yeah, is uh, exception rather than the rule. So the rule is stoning to death. And then we go to another, an, another passage in this time in the New Testament. And this connects with uh, numbers, what we have read earlier. And here Jesus is speaking. And as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So uh, I check a little bit. And the hopsoo, lifted up, is just the Greek. And then from the Aramaic, zikar, which means to elevate or execute on a given. A gibbet is a pool, so like how, somehow a precursor of the Roman crucifixion. As we will know later, the crucifixion is borrowed by the Persians from the Assyrians. That is just one pool, uh, a stake as we call it, and then you just impale a person on it. So anyway, going back to John, the lifted up word is a picture of, of crucifixion. And in fact, uh, in, in, in the book of in the Gospel of John, like in chapter 8, 28, 12, 34, the lifting up refers to crucifixion and another else. And then in applying the symbol to himself, Jesus explicitly allowed the use of symbols, the cross. Remember the symbol? It's just a vehicle of something invisible. It's the visible of the invisible message. So Jesus quoted as he talked to Nicodemus, and he said, remember, the cross, the bronze serpent, I mean the bronze serpent. So as Moses lifted up. So Jesus explicitly allowed the use of symbols. And I think there's not much problem with this. Because when we look at the, the landscape, so to speak, of the Old Testament, many symbols. You know, the death of the lamb, when you enter the sanctuary, and many other things. So God is using illustrations. And most uh, precisely in the New Testament, when Jesus used parables, these are symbols. And, and, and they have religious connotations and meaning. So we go again very quickly to uh, move on. Next passage. 
that has a messianic uh, tone is Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Here, Paul interpreted Deuteronomy 21, 22, 23 as messianic. Now again, take note that the manner of death in the Old Testament prescribed by the Torah is not crucifixion. It is stoning by death. It's different. So you see, it's already prescribed. So this is the, like the background. Now we go to the theological aspect. We have here, number one, a symbol of Christ's suffering, that is the cross. The cross is a symbol of Christ's suffering and self-denial. And he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So here, uh, if you look at Matthew 10, the context there is when he sends the 12, uh, yes, 12 disciples, and of course, it, the, the nature of their work and you know, the cross taking uh, could mean, among others, the suffering, burden bearing as we follow Christ or the cause of discipleship. Yes, so number two, it is the symbol, the cross is the symbol of the gospel. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now take note, friends, that here, for the message of the cross. Again, what's a symbol? It's the visible sign, a thing, of an invisible, of what is invisible. So here, when Paul said, for the message of the cross, this is a description that the cross indeed is a symbol. Is that correct? Uh, are you following me? Okay, I hope. Uh, uh, again, in the Asian context, when no one is answering, it's yes, okay? So, let's continue. We have here number three in the theological uh, 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 dimension. We have here the symbol of redemption. The cross as a symbol of redemption. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. Of course, this alluded unmistakably to Christ's crucifixion. There are other meanings, no? And the theological meanings is actually, as they say, I don't know whether it's academic, it's pregnant, so to speak. So many. The other theological meanings derived from the cross are many. Self-humiliation. Christ obedience. This is very important. This is one thing I've learned when I, uh, I studied here some time ago, that I was really touched when in our discussion, Christ had to learn obedience because he was God. He never learned obedience before, but when he became man, and ultimately, the 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 the, the, the ultimate pure, uh, the, the purest form and substance, so to speak, the grandest example of obedience is at the cross. Obedience, self-humiliation, burden bearing, new life in Christ, reconciliation, endurance, and others. All biblical teachings and doctrines streams from streams from Calvary's cross. This is from, from the pen of inspiration, Ellen White. Gospel Workers 315, all biblical teachings and doctrines stems from Calvary's cross. So, so at this point, friends, what we're doing is that we, we make a survey, brief as it is, about what's really the background of the cross. Is there a problem with it? So are you following me now? We look at the, uh, the biblical text, Old Testament, and the theology of the New Testament. Because this is the issue. And uh, I forgot to say at the outset that this issue is not only in the Philippines. Also true in Indonesia. I just asked uh, our, our beloved leader, Brother Henry Sitangang, and he told me, he emailed me, yes, even in Indonesia, there are those brethren of ours who strongly believe that the cross is a pagan symbol, if not maybe a Catholic symbol. And I think this is also true if we widen the, the, the area, not even just in, in these two countries, but in, maybe in some parts of the world. Is that right? Okay, so it's an issue indeed. Now we go to the history. After we look at the Bible, we'll check if there are problems. And in the cross in history, there are about 385 kinds of crosses. Encyclopedia Heraldica. There are pre-Christian crosses, first category, and we go to Christian crosses. Pre-Christian, we have the swastika, the crux gamata, the ankh, the Greek or equilateral cross, and then we have the tau or the comesa cross. So these are the, uh, at least very quickly, the, the one at your, at your right, uh, yes, it's the, we have the swastika, and it's familiar to us, right? <laughs> Hitler's Germ Nazi. Okay, and then Nazi Germany. And then we have there the, the Ankh. This is the Egyptian cross. We have the Greek equilateral cross used by the Assyrians, if you go in history. 
Tao cross used by the other peoples, ancient pagan peoples. Now, take note that these crosses, ancient crosses, intrinsically, by nature, are religious symbols. Take note of that. They are not just for ornaments or, you know what, for ordinary use. No, they are religious symbols in the temples, in their etc., etc. It's a religious symbol and it's sacred to them. Okay, like that. Now we go to Christian crosses. There are many, but I just cite two, which I think very important. We have the St. Andrew's cross, the Dicosata, and in the Latin cross, Latin, that's Roman, the cross, Crux Imessa. Very quickly in history, we have your Darius, Darius I, crucified, first recorded crucifixion in history, Encyclopedia Britannica. 3,000 were crucified in Babylon because they opposed the king, the Persian king. Antiochus Epiphanes IV introduced crucifixion in Palestine according to Josephus. And then, uh, 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 and I'm happy with this because Josephus in his writings in Antiquities 18 chapter 3 mentioned in passing Christ's crucifixion during Pilate's governorship. And this is an extra biblical source that the Bible is indeed historically correct, especially our greatest figure, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then we have your Christian crosses. Towards your right is the, the, the X, you know, the Dicosata, the, the Greek. And then, uh, uh, no, sorry, this is the St. Andrew's cross. Why? Because uh, Apostle Andrew, according to tradition, they believe was crucified in this cruciform, in this kind of, because a cross is anything that intersects at, at right angles, and you have a cross. And then you have there the Latin cross. We'll go to archaeology. Oh, by the way, uh, before the archaeological findings, <clears throat> You know, I'm catching my breath. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we go to archaeological findings, there's a note here I'd like to, to read. Jesus only carried the cross beam. In Latin, we call it the patibulum, to the place of crucifixion, contrary to modern reenactments. So this is, I think some of us already know this, that in modern reenactments, in the movies, and maybe in some commentaries, but actually it's not. It's not the whole cross that Jesus carried on Via Dolorosa to Calvary. No. In, in, according to sources, because the uh, economic reasons, wood is very, you know, scare, scarce in, uh, in, in Palestine. So the, the, the vertical column, it's fixed. And then they just carry the, the condemned uh, person who just carry the patibulum or the cross beam. So actually, this is what we are told. Archaeological findings. This is very important. Please uh, take note of this. Professor Sokinik of Hebrew University discovered usuaries. And also worry is a stone coffin. This is very, very common in Middle East. Yeah, especially in biblical times, okay, like New Testament times, and maybe some other times. So we have here Professor Sokinik. He discovered ossuaries, I think about 11, in a suburb of Jerusalem in the Talpiot district in 1945. One ossuary, or uh, an ossuaries, uh, uh, an ossuary, is, this is, uh, okay. On ossuary number eight were drawn four large crosses. This was dated around AD 42, 43. And what time was this? During the time of the primitive church, right? Just about 10 years or something like that, a little more than 10 years after Jesus' crucifixion. We're talking here of the time of the first Christians as well as the apostles leading the church after Christ's ascension to heaven. So we have here the cross were already, see, how did, how did Sukhenek confirm or how did he know? Well, because the other materials in this uh, family tomb, there were potteries, there were coins, were dated to that particular time, AD 41, 40 to 43. A recent discovery by Silal Simsik in Laodicea of cross imposed on top of menorah and published in, in uh, 2006. Well, they're not sure whether this is in the second century or the fourth century. But take note, the Sakenik's discovery is very important to our, for, our, for our purposes this afternoon. So we'll go very quickly to the motifs and monograms of early church. So they have the anchor, and then monograms can also be their symbols, and it's etched on their monuments, yeah, and then in the catacombs, and uh, etc. So you have anchor, the word ectus. So actually, this is an abbreviation for Esus Christus Teuho Vios Soter. So actually, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So that's why. Sometimes in, in, on vehicles, they put fish and then Jesus, see? Because of this uh, Christian tradition. We have also the Noah's Ark, Abraham slaying a lamb instead of Isaac. And then you have shepherd carrying a lamb. And then some scholars said, no, the earliest is 
a cross with a lamb under it. That's the first uh, earliest monogram. Now, very quickly, we go to the traditions of the cross. Second century Christians adopted the sign of the cross. They used the thumb and gestured the sign of the cross on the head and the body at the same time, invoking God's name, according to Shaft. The point here, friends, is that in the second century, there is tradition coming out associated with the cross and crucifixion. So we have in third century, Tertullian attested that the sign of the cross became widespread. It's making a sign of the cross became widespread practice among Christians. And then unfortunately, the sign of the cross, prayers for the dead, veneration of martyrs developed into crucifix, purgatory, worship of the saints, images, according to Fromm. Third and fourth centuries, symbols of swastika and inter intersected Greek letters, the, the, the chi and the rho, rho, we are commonly used by Constantine in his standard. So they are uh, intersected together. And that's why we some, see the, something like that, the Cairo, because of Constantine. Now, another important uh, aspect here that is irrelevant to our study is the veneration of the cross. Helena, mother of Constantine in 326, discover, discovery of the cross that Jesus died, supposed discovery. Miracles attended this cross, but these miracles were legendary and apocrypha, even mentioned by Marucci in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Two councils of the church that commanded the adoration and veneration of crosses. We have the Council of Nicaea, 8787, and the Council of Constantinople in 8869. So because of this, see, you have there the, 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 the fixing, so to speak, the, the, the veneration, traditions of the cross were established among Christians, at least, but not all Christians. Maybe we can see to nominal and, and, and uh, to, to many, the, the majority of Christians. We have also here iconoclasm. There was a reaction, though, in the use of cross because, you know, it's you know, sometimes even beyond reason that, uh, the, you know, these traditions are, are becoming unreasonable. Okay? And then we have here image breaking arose in the 8th and 9th centuries. But iconoclast, that is image breakers, exempted the plain cross. And we have here Peter of Royce in, in the 12th century, 1105-1126. Extreme iconoclast, he's, he's a leader of the extreme iconoclasts that uh, were against crosses and churches. And in fact, he advocated a more uh, you know, drastic action, burning crosses and you know, destroying churches. And then we go very quickly into L, uh, the cross in Elamite writings. Now, uh, brethren, I want you to look at three passages and, and think for yourself what is the view of Ellen White regarding the symbol of the cross. So we have first, first citation, Testimonies 4, 503. Can we read it all? Ah, maybe, uh, no need me. The, uh, I'll just read. The cross of Christ is our only hope. You just read with me. It reveals to us the greatness of our Father's love. And the fact that the majesty of heaven submitted to insult, mockery, humiliation, and suffering for the joy of seeing perishing souls saved in his kingdom. First quotation. Let's go to the second quote. To remove the cross from the Christian would be like blotting the sun from the sky. The cross brings us near to God, reconciling us to him. Now, take notice of the third quote. G.C. 658. As the Jews profess to revere the law, so the Romanists claim to reverence the cross. They exalt the symbol of Christ's sufferings while in their lives they deny him whom it represents. If you go on to this in this page, you will see that Ellen White cited like the wearing crucifixes, the traditions of the cross as unbiblical and erroneous. He condemns this, okay, but not the symbol of the cross per se. So, the, the, the summary here, the cross is a key motive in Ellen White's writings. A quick perusal of her writing shows that her view of the cross conforms to the Bible. Her theology of the cross is balanced and profound. Contrarily, she condemned the veneration of crosses and images as unbiblical and erroneous. Precisely, she did not in a single instance condemn the use of the cross as a symbol, but its superstitions and unbiblical traditions. Now, these are the findings and conclusion. Recommended findings, number one, all these messianic prophecies portrayed the crucifixion of the Messiah and the cross. Two, the bronze serpent symbolized the cross in OT. 
The symbol and its message are inseparable. Otherwise, it will cease to be a symbol. You cannot have a symbol that's in in invisible. No. And then you have the number four. Inti's theology of the symbol of the cross is abundant, profound, and balanced, but not veneration of crosses and images or crucifixes. Number five, the Latin cross was distinct from ancient crosses because it was not at the beginning a religious symbol. Take note of this. This is very important. It, this, it may shed light to our quest in this subject matter that the late Latin cross or the Roman cross was distinct from ancient crosses because at the very beginning, ancient crosses were religious in nature. Whereas the Latin cross was not a religious symbol. Maybe it is a, a, a symbol of death and crucifixion, but not a religious symbol. Meaning, in the eyes of the Romans, it has no religious meaning, save that it's an instrument of death. But after Jesus' death, according to Stott, in, in the, my, my full paper, the cross had a new meaning in the eyes, especially of the followers of Christ. So the Latin cross was distinct from ancient crosses. Oh, time is up. Because it was not at the beginning a religious symbol. Historical evidence strongly favors the Latin cross as the one used on Jesus' crucifixion. This is the view of Catholic Encyclopedia. Archaeological evidence is overwhelming that the Latin cross is not a Roman Catholic symbol. Why? Since its use antedated Catholicism. Remember, in the ossuaries of first century, there was yet no Catholic institution at that time as, uh, as, as an institution and, and a church. But it was already used by, by Christians. And that is really Sukhenik's uh, conclusion, that it was the earliest, the discovery was the earliest evidence of Christianity and of the story, historicity of Jesus Christ. And then we have here, again, uh, again, archaeological evidence is overwhelming that the Latin cross is not a Roman Catholic symbol since its use antedated Catholicism. And then number eight, Ellen White's view of the cross comports, that is, is in accord with that of New Testament. Number nine, the use of the cross and veneration of the cross are not identical. So when you use a symbol of the cross, like what we see in our logo, and veneration of the cross as practiced in the Catholic communion, they are not the same. Because the use, whereas the former is biblical, symbols abound, we know that. The latter is not. Venerations, traditions of the crosses are not biblical. They're just based on human traditions. And then number 10, Jesus, Paul, Ellen White, used the symbol of the cross. Therefore, the Latin cross, freed from false theology and traditions, is a biblical and a valid symbol of Christianity in general and Adventism in particular. The biblical cross is a symbol of God's immeasurable love for man's redemption. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Well, uh, we'll open the floor for question. If there were, uh, since we are running out of time and another presentation is waiting, we'll take only two, only two questions, one and over here. Pastor Kambele, please. Uh, I would not have so much as a question, but I would like to have something, you know, this problem with the cross on our churches, it's a problem for some, and it's not a problem for many, or I don't know how many people. But the thing is, uh, let me give you an example. We were riding, we were going to a church in a far, far place. And then uh, we saw a church, it was white, it was beautiful. The scenery is green and the air is clean, but then we had this discussion. We asked amongst ourselves, is this an Adventist church? Is that the church that we're heading for? And someone said, no, that's not the Adventist church. It has cross in it. And so we went our way. And then someone said, no, let's stop and let's take a look. So to some people, it causes problems. To others, it does not. For me personally, symbols are just that. They're just drawings representing something, probably. But the reality is Jesus. Now, Paul once wrote, Why is my liberty being judged with someone else's conscience? Uh, right? Since we're running out of time, can uh, you please, come uh, to the question, please? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not going, I'm not making a question per se. I am, I am just trying to point to, 
to all of us something that is this is very important you know and I do hope that you give me a few minutes just a few minutes because I want I want to be in the side of those who were this fellow because of this and this is a serious issue we once did this a forum about this in our church and it went on until sundown and until 7 p.m. and we were not able to resolve it and it's a very big issue because so many people are now complaining, especially those who are personal friends of mine. They, they ask me, have you been to that church where they have this giant cross inside on the pulpit? It's an Adventist church, they say. And they have this giant cross. Now, please do give me time. Because I, I, really, want, I really want people to hear from the side of those who are complaining. Right? Because I, I, do, I do get everyone's point. That is good. And I, and I agree with it. But to those who are against it, it's not because it's either pagan or Catholic. They don't like it. It's the, the very reason that they don't like it is that to them, it seems we are now going over to the Catholics. And we should listen to them. And I am here to voice out their opinions. That this is the reason why I went here. So okay. please do give me time, please. Thank I'll you very much, minutes. and I think maybe you write a paper on that. No, no, no. Uh, to discuss uh, about that again, because uh, we are we yeah, are yeah, working I, on I, time. I do, so. I do, I, I do. But please do listen to me first, please. Just a few more minutes, and I, I am looking at my time. I may be young, but I want you to hear from them, and I'm not afraid. Uh, okay, so one more, one more point. Brother, that's why, sorry to interrupt, but that's why the point here is not the opinion of some groups or even anyone. No, no. But it should be based on, I'm presenting you not just mere opinions, but yeah. based on the, the biblical aspect, the theology, and the historical yes, background. Yes, yes, I, so, I do understand. And I do hope that you let me finish too, because every time you do that, uh, we get on longer. Uh, I was about to get to my point anyway. So here's the, here's the thing. Why is my liberty being judged by someone else's conscience? And here is what Paul is teaching us to become self-deniers. If the symbol of the cross offends someone in the church, then don't put it there. Why? Because why are you going to destroy that person who Christ died for? Right? My dear pastors, my dear friends, my dear brothers. If it offends someone, please don't do it. This is what Paul said. If your food destroys someone, then don't eat it. It may be good. It may be good, really. You may be, we may all be right about this. But then someone, someone who's not here, someone who was disfellowed, he was offended. He did not attend church, and he went against the church because of it. Okay. Should we not um, listen? Thank you, brother. I, yes. We got your point very yes, clear. Yes, yes. That, that, was, that was the point I was uh, trying to get across anyway. Yes, Thanks. you're right. And uh, what you uh, cited in Romans, if I'm not mistaken, 13, is in the context of food, not crosses, by the way. And then uh, let me... Con okay. But we have also another statement of Paul that uh, to, the, to the evil, all things are evil. But to the pure, all things are pure. So we have to balance perspective. So... Thank you. Uh, suppose you are a pastor, you are conducting the burial ceremony. And uh, I don't know whether here in the Philippines, I'm here. You are using the crosses on the tombs or not. I don't know. But for us in the Congo, we don't use the crosses on tombs when we are burying Adventists uh, who, who die. So. Uh, my question is this, if you are a pastor, you are conducting that uh, Bible ceremony, are you going to put the cross on the tomb of an Adventist here? Do you use it? Okay, well that's now a good oh, Okay, that's now, let me finish the question. Okay. If you cannot use it, why? Because it's just a symbol of uh, Christianity in general as it is put in your conclusion there. It's just to show that this is someone who dies in cross. In cross is not uh, even a veneration of the cross. Nothing wrong with it. But if as Adventist pass, you say no, we cannot put the cross. Yes. 
and the church members are looking at it, they will say, oh, it means that as Adventists, we do not use the cross. But when they will see the cross somewhere else, the symbol of the cross, you say, no, they, they, this is, does not have the problem. At the same time, you as pastor, you cannot put the, the cross on the tomb to show them that we don't use the cross. So the issue is there. We need to explain to them when do we use the symbol of the cross and when we cannot use it so that they will not be in a kind of confusion. So, okay, uh, that's a, a valid and sensible question. Uh, in, my, in my sense, your question is a local one, just one country like Philippines, but the log is international. Now, why is it that in the Philippines, and it's true, we don't usually, I haven't seen yet one, that uh, in, the, in the cemetery, when we bury our own members of our church, we put crosses, because common sense dictates. We're a Christian nation. We're not a Buddhist or an Islamic country, so what's the need of crosses? So, you see? And, that's, I, and, I, I, and I think that's wise. So here, not just the indiscriminate or carrying the, the, the using the symbol of the cross to the extreme, to the, to the, to the minute details, but here it's wisdom, uh, and I think it's, it's the right thing to do. Uh, there are a few more questions, but since we are running out of time, maybe you ask it personally to him. I think he'll be happy to clarify it and more discussion. Uh, thank you very much for your participation and your attendance. Uh, at this time, I would like to present this certificate of appreciation to our, uh, <clears throat> to our presenter, Francis Doroy. Since uh, we have heard about it, all the words are just the same. So it's a certificate of appreciation from AATS for presenting in, in this uh, forum. Thank you so much. <laughs>